hadn't anticipated uh, talking about it at all uh, today. We rejiggered stuff because this is a big deal. And it's, it's fascinating. We can't quite figure out what happened here, and this is what we hope to figure out today when we talk to these people. It was not a turnout issue. There was significantly more, 50% more turnout in this election than in 2012, which is a presidential year. Cantor's vote total law uh, dropped from 20, about 29,000, uh, or I should say it dropped from almost 37,000 to about 29,000. Bratt, uh, his challenger, a professor from a local college, uh, his um, vote tally was about 36,000. Like I say, there was almost 20,000 more votes than in 2012. Turnup was up in every county in the district. 17,000 extra people vote uh, show up to vote against. I mean, this is... Uh, and the, the cash, Cantor spent, I don't know, uh, some portion of $5 million. I'm not exactly sure, but Bratt had... 200,000 and still has, I think, 80,000 on cash on hand. But let's just assume he spent the whole 200,000. I mean, there are a lot of different theories as to why this happened, not the least of which that Eric Cantor was just a jerk. I mean, just an a hole. Uh, and people in his home district just got sick of him because there was some guy who, um, who could actually put together a couple of sentences. But, you know, we're going to dig into this today. It's a fascinating story. On the phone, on an Amtrak train, I imagine, uh, headed towards New York, but I don't know. Uh, Ryan Grimm. Ryan, thank you so much for getting on the train. We always like to mix things up here. And uh, I said I, I wanted you moving while we talked. Yeah, lousy day to be leaving Washington, though. Yeah, indeed. Uh, all right. Uh, let, this, is, um, this is stunning by any sort of measure. Um, his in, uh, uh, Cantor's internal polling had him up 34 points. Uh, that seemed to have a pretty wide margin of error. Or it didn't have a large enough right. one. <laughs> um, the Daily Caller apparently had a uh, poll that had him up 11 points uh, about a week ago. Um, give me your sense. I mean, we're hearing it's, it's about immigration and this and that. I mean, as far as I can tell, it's just his district just thought Eric Cantor was a jerk at the very least. But... This is sort of, it's, it seems bizarre to me. I mean, 20,000 more don't, votes on an off-year election? Yeah, don't, don't underestimate the, the jerk factor. Uh, I, think, I think that had a lot to do with it. I mean, uh, in, his, in his district, uh, people uh, just didn't like him. Uh, some, somebody did a count of the number of tweets last night that included the, the phrase, I like Eric Cantor, and came up with something like two or three. Um, which is astonishing for somebody whose career is ending. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's just no warmth out there for the guy. Uh, and, you know, and this is somebody who drew his own district uh, in 2010, you know, when they, when they redistricted. So he really had no, no excuse here. And, and I, this is why I don't think he'll run a write-in, uh, because there really isn't, I don't, I don't really see the path for him here. You know, his, his path was just to not get beaten in a Republican primary. Um, so I, you know, I really think that's a big part of it. He, you know, there's some kind of Greek irony or whatever you'd want to call it here too. In that, you know, he really was the guy who embraced the Tea Party and leadership more than anybody else. You know, the Tea Party was defined by its opposition to everything, and Eric Cantor became part of that everything. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Brian Boitler had a piece that basically said uh, that this was, uh, you know, what I've referred to in the past as, you know, Frankenstein's monster uh, just running loose through the streets, and Frankenstein himself can't do anything about it. I, I actually like the, um, the Hunt for Red October analogy, when those Russians accidentally blew their own submarine up, you know, trying to take the Americans out. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. You, you, they... they you know they they couldn't control this this beast that they that they fed and fueled. Well, give me your sense. I mean, what what about the cooter effect uh, from uh, 
from Dukes of Hazzard. Yes. Uh, ben Jones. I mean, in other words, uh, Ben Jones made a public call for people to cross party because this is an open primary. I mean, there were mm-hmm. 20,000 extra votes. I, 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 I just wonder, like, you know, that's a really motivated um, uh, primary electorate. It is. And, you know, there was no there was no reason for Democrats to vote in their own primary because there, there was only one person running. Uh so there was just been a bit of waste of time for Democrats in that district to vote their own, so they could choose to jump over and vote against Eric Cantor in the Republican primary. And I've seen some people do run some numbers that, and and been unconvinced that the Democrats. But I don't I don't actually think that their analysis of the numbers is, is necessarily convincing. I don't, I don't know if they're looking at quite the right thing. I think there's, there's no question that some people did that. Uh, the, the question we'll probably never be able to answer is, you know, how many did it, uh, and w- would he have won without it? And I think certain. I, I think it's pretty certain that he would have won this. Uh, he, he being Brett would have won this regardless of what Democrats did. Um, but I, I think they certainly padded his padded his victory. Right, and and I also wonder. I mean, here's a guy who has. I don't know if he had any ads on television. He didn't spend more than a hundred and twenty thousand dollars, from what I can tell. He still got eighty thousand cash on hand. I don't know if there was no, any. But can- cancer did it for him. Uh, you know, cancer spent two million dollars uh, trashing this guy as a professor who's too liberal for the district. And what that did is it made sure that every voter in, in the district knew that there was. A, a serious alternative to Eric Cantor. So he might have even been better off if he didn't say a single word the whole time. Well, that that's what I want to ask you. I mean, because Jack Tram, uh, Tremel, who is going to be the Democratic opponent in the fall, is also a professor at the exact same college, uh, <laughs> right. is presumably yeah. a liberal. So is this, I mean, is this going to be confusing for the electorate now? Like, which uh, prof- liberal professor are they going to vote for from this uh, college when it comes to fall? And if you're going to vote for a liberal professor, you might as well go all the way and pick the Democrat, right? Well, um, I mean, I think the only path for him, though, is if uh, if cancer uh, elects to uh, mount some write-in campaign, which I don't think he will, because uh, then what? Uh, you know, he will already have lost his majority leader spot. He's, you know, he's in the process of getting humiliated right now in the Capitol. And and is he that now? Does he automatically step down from that uh, position, or is it just like nobody takes him seriously because he's not going to be around in uh, January? Right, it's not auto- automatic, but uh, you know, the co- the conference can force the issue, and there are enough people already saying that they want to run against him that that that's enough to to force the issue. So, so who runs against him? I mean, uh, now, my understanding is that it has played out like this over the years. At first, Cantor was the sort of the Tea Party's guy in the caucus. He was fighting uh, uh, Boehner's attempts to, to forge a deal, uh, you know, maybe the grand bargain or whatnot with uh, President Obama. And then he sort of shifted and said, no, I'm a company man because I want to be the Speaker of the House. Boehner, you're going to retire so that you can go make a lot of money as a lobbyist uh, and have, you know, instead of like three-hour uh, liquid lunches, you know, like 16-hour liquid lunches. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and so so uh, so who who ends up replacing him? And does Boehner now stay as Speaker of the House because the Chamber of Commerce is now terrified? I mean, what what happens? So immediately, Kevin McCarthy, who's the number three. Uh, he, he's, he's a he's a climber. I'm sorry. Say California his name. Ag- I, say his say his name again. Uh, we we lost you. Kevin though. McCarthy. Okay. Um, he's one of these teachers' pets from. Uh, he's from California. Uh, he's been a politician since he was like 12 years old. Um, uh, and he's one of those guys that nobody really likes, um, but people don't terribly dislike him. And he he works hard. And, um, he's just kind of just steadily climbed his way through through the ranks. So he's going to try to push from number three to number two. Uh, Pete Sessions is also going to run. He's uh, a guy from Texas. Um, he is not considered terribly uh, strong either. Uh, it doesn't look... It, 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 I, it's not clear if Jeb Hensterling is going to run. He would be the Tea Party favorite. He's the current Financial Services Committee chairman. Um, he might he might run um, if he doesn't. 
um, he's probably he's likely to run, you know, in, in January of 2015. But whatever happens in this round, uh, it's just going to sow more confusion between now and, and January when when the real kind of elections will happen, and that and that's when Boehner will have to decide whether or not he wants to, you know, r- take another ride in his clown car. Now, McCarthy, my understanding is is not terribly good when it comes to whipping votes. Is that is that is is, is <laughs> that right. accurate? No, no, nobody has any. I mean, in his defense, there are no earmarks uh, anymore, um, and the and folks that were elected uh, by the Tea Party, uh, I would not want the task of having to try to round them up. Right. Uh, on the on the other hand, he is uh, famously terrible uh, at at his job. So, um, <laughs> it, you know, if he rises to number two, he's going to just uh, kind of back into it. So, okay, so. Now, legislatively speaking, right, there, this doesn't really make that much of a difference. I mean, I don't buy the notion that immigration reform was going to happen maybe, maybe, maybe in the uh, lame duck session. But there's no way, right? So, I mean, is this going to make a difference from a legislative standpoint, A, or are we, yeah. or are we going to see, like, there's going to be 10 more votes, 15 more votes to uh, defund, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act? Right. I mean— well, it's already, you know, distinguish it's already me, June. Distinguish for me uh, the legislative uh, potential versus what the political implications will be short run and uh, in the run up to 2014. Right. So it's it's already June. So you you weren't going to see much legislation happening uh, between now and January anyway. And if you if you are going to by some miracle see immigration happens, uh, let's say it happens in the lame duck or something, this doesn't make it any less likely. In fact, it even makes it more likely. Republicans realize they've got this toxic nuclear issue, uh, and maybe they decide they want to get rid of it, the lame duck, and, and do something about it. Uh, but, but the, you know, so that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't have any immediate on, on legislation. I'm back. Okay, yeah. I was just explaining to people I had asked you to actually be on an airplane for this, but we couldn't uh, work out the uh, the proper uh-huh. reservations. All right, so you were saying, so legislatively, I mean, maybe this makes immigration more likely in the lame duck, but uh, unlikely. Uh, but what does it do to the politics? Well, you know, it, it just drives, you know, it just drives everybody further to the right. Um, if, there's, if, they, if they can find any room on the right, um, I think the most substantial consequences that next year the house is that much less governable because eric Cantor was the guy that everybody relied on to bring the tea party around at the last minute um you know after boehner tried every everything he could think of to try to get some grand bargain or or even a mini tiny bargain um when that was failed they'd say okay well let's just do this and eric you go and round up enough tea party votes now they don't have anybody who could do that nor do they necessarily have anybody who would want to do that, because right? they've seen what the the personal consequences of, of taking all those nicks every time you have to go back to the Tea Party and ask them to do something they don't want to do. All right. Well, Ryan, let me ask you this. Am I um, out of my mind to take some comfort that this is going to make— uh, uh, let's just uh, assume this scenario. The Senate is taken over by the Republicans— the president wants to uh, make the grand bargain uh, because now the, the Republicans are driving. Does this make that scenario less likely? In other words, because you've got Cantor out there, regardless of who replaces him, the wildly incompetent uh, McCarthy or the uh, lunatic Tea Party guys, um, does this make... A, a calc- does this change the calculation for the administration in the event that the Republicans take over the Senate? It, it, it no longer becomes uh, Bill Clinton, 1996? Yeah, I mean, there certainly is that much less of a chance for a grand bargain because that would involve uh, raising taxes. And I don't see how, the, uh, you know, the, the new House would, would do that. Just for, you know, you can basically forget about that. And also, the White House seems much less interested in that um, than they used to be. And they've lost all of their institutional support on the left for it. Even even the Center for American Progress is now strongly against a, a grand bargain. Uh, and, you know, and that's basically the extension of the administration. Right. And um, so 
I mean, it, 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 I guess it's a fun. I, I mean, so what is it? What, what, now, what do the Democrats do um, in terms of trying to to nationalize this outcome, I guess, into 2014? I mean, is, do you think there's going to be any impact on these uh, midterm elections? Uh, no, I don't I don't I don't think so. Um, I think this is uh, I mean, to the extent that anybody would care, you know, it's mostly Democrats uh, who are already paying close attention to politics. I don't really see how, uh, you know, a, a normally informed voter uh, is dissuaded one way or another on this. So maybe you can think of some way that they would be. I guess it makes them look a little crazier, but you have to be paying a lot of attention for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's I think it's unlikely unless the sort of the Democrats then now I don't know. Uh, it, I guess it doesn't change their plans in any way, right? I mean, in terms of promoting, um, uh, you know, uh, immigration reform or. Um, or or anything else for that matter. I mean, I guess it's uh, right, but it, it it certainly changes the politics within the um uh, the. I I wonder if it changes the way that people are going to Republicans are going to run in the fall in any fashion. I don't necessarily think so because they know that their primary is a good way away from the general election. Um, you know, they have time to, uh, and, and most of them are in very Republican safe districts anyway, so they're going to they're gonna throw their red meat around um, like they were going to anyway. So, I, I, so just, I mean, you know, uh, Cantor's district was an, is an R plus 10 in terms of the partisan index. Is this just too big of a, a mountain to climb? Um, I mean, assuming that uh, Brat, and I've heard him speak, uh, is a um, you know is is not going to start talking about um, uh, you know uh, uh, rape or uh, other issues. Uh -huh. um, is this just too high of a of a mountain for Jack Trammell uh, to climb? Uh, do you think the the Democrats put any money in there or what? Uh, I think anything's possible. I mean, it's a tough. It's still a very tough race for them. Um, but you know, you know, he's not an evangelical. Um, so he's less likely to, you know, talk about legitimate rape like you like you said. He's more of a libertarian. He talks about but, God you know, people, quite a bit, though. I got to tell you, uh, this guy talks about God a lot. Um, at least well, last night right. on Hannity, he did. Yes, I mean, so people don't know much about him. So you know, who knows what who knows what comes out? You know, when you have somebody who's just a completely kind of random guy thrown into the thrown into the race and into the spotlight uh anything's possible who knows what they could dig up about him same with trammell of course right good point well um ryan grimm thanks for your time today you can now uh get off at the next stop and head back to dc i appreciate oh, you sounds good i appreciate you getting on the train for us